So I started writing about loneliness by accident. It seems too simple to say I wrote about loneliness because I was often lonely, although I was. It was 2016 during an election cycle that left many of us feeling wrenched from reality. And suddenly I was seeing loneliness everywhere. I'd walk down the street or step onto the subway during my morning commute and find that I couldn't stop watching people who were physically alone. Someone eating a sloppy euro on the curb while they stare blankly into space. An exhausted, an exhausted nurse still in her scrubs nodding off on the bus. The bodega cashier scrolling absently through his phone before a backdrop of Fritos pinned to the wall. There was nothing verifiably lonely about any of these people, and the fact that I identified loneliness in them said a lot more about me than it did about them. I wanted to see their loneliness because I was feeling it myself. So I started to draw. I drew people pacing in parking lots, asleep on the subway, glimpsed through their apartment windows. I thought for a time that this was as far as the project would go, but as I kept drawing, I realized I had questions I couldn't answer. What was the difference between being alone and being lonely? Why don't we talk about our loneliness very often? What is loneliness exactly, and why do we feel it at all? I began reading books with titles like Alone Together and The Lonely American and Loneliness as a Way of Life, along with a whole slew of scientific and self-help books that I'd have been embarrassed to be seen reading in the public spaces I was drawing. Every book brought with it more questions and the project got broader. How is loneliness depicted in pop culture? What's the connection between loneliness and violence? What about politics? What about gender? What actually happens to our bodies when we're isolated for too long? And in a country that prides itself on individualism and privacy hedges, how do we fix it? So what I found was much worse than I imagined. Basically, loneliness will kill you. Lonely people are more likely to have heart attacks and cancer and alcoholism and even common colds. Loneliness can make us assume the worst in others and see enemies and harmless strangers and instill a creeping paranoia about our unlovability. Loneliness is an emergency. I spent nearly three years fixated on the problems that I thought isolated Americans most. Our insistence on individualism, our unrelenting attitudes towards work, our cavernous political divides. I wrote about the cold contours of the internet, theories about racing socially adjusted children and how gun violence partitions us in fear. Then, as public spaces emptied out our malls and public schools and schools closed during the first lockdowns of 2020, there were no longer any masses. Individualism crumbled as a concept, and those who clung to it were jeered. We were reminded that we are only as healthy as the sickest among us. Mutual aid groups formed, and we again recognized that we owe one another as human beings. And still, we were lonelier than ever. One of the best descriptions of loneliness I've ever read is from Maggie Nelson's Bluettes, in which she writes, loneliness is solitude with a problem. Whether or not a person is lonely isn't necessarily tied to how much time one spends alone or how many friends one has. Our personal threshold for loneliness are biologically programmed into us before we're even born. Um, so I'll read a little excerpt from the book and then we can kind of open this up to questions and just have a conversation. I'm really curious for all of your thoughts on this topic and I'm really glad we're making time to talk about it. Vivek Murthy, the former, surgeon, the former U.S. Surgeon General, has said that the most prevalent health issue in America is isolation. Loneliness will be classified as an epidemic by 2030. In 2017, a research team aggregated 70 studies, totaling over 3 million subjects, and found that those who reported feelings of loneliness were more likely to be dead by the time the studies were over than those who identified as socially fulfilled. Those who lived independently were 32% more likely to have died within a seven year period than those who shared their homes with others. It's easy to hypothesize that if we live alone, we're more subject to an accident when balancing our weight on the edge of a rickety stool, reaching for something on a too high shelf. We may not be alerted to our home's intruder by a lighter sleeping spouse because we have no spouse, and so we wander down the stairs in our nightshirts, wielding a cell phone's light to investigate the noise we're certain we've imagined. Many of us behave at our worst when no one is watching. Those who are lonely are more likely to smoke cigarettes, more likely to remain physically inactive, more likely to suffer from high blood pressure, alcoholism, and weakened immune systems, more likely to have insomnia. Solo living is the mark of a wealthy country. It's easier to avoid or delay marriage and childbirth and more possible to afford an apartment for one, which you're likely to find yourself in again if you outlive those closest to you. For decades, epidemiologists lined up behind the social control hypothesis, 
If no one is around to issue judgmental glances when we eat junk food at midnight or tisk at the days we spend in bed, of course we'll be more unhealthy. Of course we'll die sooner. But since the late 80s, rows of studies impart that the difference in life expectancy between those who are socially isolated and those who are not is too great to attribute to its cause only to individual behaviors like smoking or drinking or sitting still. The problem isn't so much in, how, in the time one spends alone, but in how one feels about that aloneness. A hallmark of loneliness is shame. Since childhood, there are few things more humiliating than being left out. Loneliness implies a flaw in us like no other longing or sadness does. I'm lonely translates to I'm unlovable or nobody likes me. It says that you're a loser. But loneliness isn't necessarily tied to whether you have a partner or a best friend or an aspirationally active social life. It's a variance that rests in the space between the relationships you have and the relationships you want. Loneliness lives in the gap. Psychiatrists Jacqueline Olds and Richard S. Schwartz call it the biologically determined terror of detachment. Beyond our pre-programmed drive towards numbered strength, it's difficult to ensure a, new, a steady new crop of virile community members if we live in isolation. Part of the reason you feel so bad, so lonely, so bad when you're lonely is because your body is actually trying to repel you back into a state in which you can reproduce. That's true. Anthropologist Robin Dunbar proposed that humans developed spoken language not to more effectively hunt or build or conquer, but to gossip. Gossip functions in the same way that grooming does for other primates. It creates bonds, and the bonds of language can extend further and more quickly. The development of language brought with it a fresh set of social problems, which linguist Steven Pinker put simply as a concern with one's reputation. If we're going to maintain our position within a group, which is to say fed and warm and less likely to be cornered by bears without backup or left off the coworker text chain arranging 5 p.m. drinks, we need to feel deeply troubled when we observe minor social shuns so we can correct our behavior. We must notice facial cues that signify disinterest, register body language that suggests we should back up. Early humans often migrated from place to place, but the bands they traveled with remained the same. Our as our body hair grew thinner and our teeth more rounded, so too did we become more unable to survive on our own. Evolution shoved us into molds that caused us not to only feel unsettled by rejection, but also mortally threatened. There's a reason that, short of execution, banishment was the harshest punishment a king could bestow. Loneliness is designed to alert its host to a need, just like sensations of hunger or thirst or exhaustion. Get lunch, go to bed. Seek someone out. Dr. Stephen Cole, a genomics researcher, spent most of the 90s studying how social factors impact the behaviors of HIV after the virus is contracted. As you probably remember, it's highly vari variable. I got a C minus in high school biology, and I did not remember this. Mm -hmm, of course, I said. Some people get sick and die quickly, and some people live a long time. When he turned the focus of a study to gay men who tested positive, he found that those who were closeted tended to die much sooner than those who weren't. He attributed this to stress. The closeted men had the added burden of secrecy. In the middle of this research, he met with Dr. John T. Cassiopo, Cassiopo, whom Cole called the world's expert in loneliness. I felt like loneliness, uh, kind of a nuisance risk factor, right? It couldn't be that bad for you. It's not like, you know, agony and stress and torture. By this, that by this point, Cassiopo had been conducting a decade-long study on loneliness, on more, uh, of loneliness on more than 200 subjects from whom he'd collected and frozen biological samples, and Cole, somewhat skeptically, agreed to study them. So we can look at the expression of all human genes in one fell swoop, Dr. Cole says. That's fabulous on one level, right? I mean, we can see the whole system at work at one time. But it's also kind of a nightmare, because how do you make sense of 20,000 outcomes? Dr. Cole calls the expression of human genes a big, complex conspiracy of lots of different influences. He thinks of them like octopi systems or spaghetti diagrams that converge to build a human life. Most of the time, when he looked at genomics data, he was used to seeing chaos, meaning the genes weren't expressing anything that specific. But when he tested for loneliness, he said that signal was much clearer than he'd expected. That clarity settled on one primary concern. In those who are chronically lonely, Dr. Cole told me, just about every high prevalence killer in contemporary epidemiology gets you faster. 
Loneliness feels to me like being underwater, fumbling against a muted world in which the sound of your own body is loud against the quiet of everything else. The simple gestures you enacted so easily on the ground become laborious, pushing against a weight no body is built to move through. Studying loneliness for me has been driven in a small way by the desire to find a solution to the problem, a way for each of us to swim toward a once invisible ledge and reach for it. I spent years trying to decode its science, hoping to find some chemical or biological explanation for the worst I've ever felt, or the times I've watched people I love so unsatisfied, clawing toward connection that surpasses what I'm able to give them. But science can't offer complete clarity. It wasn't until 2016 that anyone finally identified the part of the brain that feels and responds to isolation. A group at MIT found a cluster of cells in the back of mice brains that falls nearly dormant during solitary periods and goes into overdrive when they're reunited with other mice, most likely to help them recover from the time they spent alone. The hope is that this discovery can be used to answer all kinds of questions, such as why some people need a lot of interpersonal contact while others prefer to be on their own or how we might keep ourselves from dying when we lack connection for too long. When we crave closeness, I'm not sure if what we want is something we used to have or a hazy image of what we never will. And I don't have an answer for what we do when we've lost our ability to do anything but tread water. But the thing that's the clearest, in a field of study only a few decades old, is that when it comes to loneliness and its aching spread, we still don't have a clue. Like I said, it's a really uplifting book. Um, anyway, I'd love to open it up to a kind of a conversation about what you all think about loneliness, how you're addressing it as healthcare professionals, and if there's anything I can, um, any questions you have. Is it on? Obviously, we're more connected now than we ever have been. So what, what do you attribute the increase in loneliness to? And, and then are there any particular cohorts where you think they're at much, much greater risk? Yeah. Like what trends are you seeing? It's a great question. So loneliness uh, statistically peaks at three ages, your uh, mid to late 20s your mid-50s and all of your 80s. And that makes sense if you think about the fact that those are times in your life you're usually going through some big life transitions, like maybe you're uh, moving to a new place for a new job in your 20s or you're graduating college, your 50s, maybe you're nearing retirement, maybe you've had kids who are moving, at, moving out of the house, and then your 80s, your life is changing a lot. A lot of people you know are maybe not around anymore. So I think like the moments of transition are from doing interviews for the book, that was by far the time of loneliness I heard most from most people, regardless of age. Um, and the technology question is a really good one. That's a question I get a lot because we are more, in certain ways more connected than ever before. But the, the uptick in loneliness I think happened before things like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, like that's been slowly progressing over time. And there's like lots of theories for that. We move away a lot more frequently. We are more transient than we've ever have been. So it's a complicated question. Um, I try to stay away from, I think like there's a real tendency to demonize technology as the reason. I, I kind of resist that. I think technology can be a source of isolation, but it's also when you look at people who maybe have like limited mobility issues, people who are geographically isolated, social media can be like a massive way to connect in that way. Like I think about, I live in New York, my family's in Wisconsin, I FaceTime with my niece twice a week. You know, she wouldn't know what I looked like if, I, if we didn't have kind of that technology. It's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm really happy to see Papa doing this. I think America has been behind uh, in other ways. Like the UK, I think we've seen them, you know, they appointed a minister of loneliness about 10 years ago. There's like a lot of nonprofits um, who are aimed at reducing loneliness, especially among seniors. So it's great to see this happening now in the States. I think the most dangerous part about loneliness is that when people feel lonely for too long, we often consider that a period of seven years that becomes chronic loneliness. We can actually enter a state of something called hypervigilance, which means we're no longer open to developing new relationships at all. 
and that is obviously a very dangerous place to be in because even if suddenly you find yourself in new circumstances, you're, you're just like not open to, to developing those friendships, those connections. So the other thing about loneliness is that it's actually contagious. So if you're feeling loneliness, you can actually transmit loneliness up to three degrees removed from you, which is um, when you think about why, when we feel lonely, we're more likely to isolate. We're more likely to be like, I'm not going to reach out to that person. They don't want to hear from me. I never hear from them. That person then experiences loneliness and passes it on. So I think if you see someone in your life who's kind of doing that, who's kind of shutting down, it's about reaching out to them, making an effort, even if it feels like a little bit laborious. I think that's a really important thing to do. Yeah. So he used to put the same to me to work on trigonometry and advanced calculus, and I just want to be, you know, out of the car. Sure. How is it that the same two people who came from the same two people mm -hmm. in the same environment, exposed to the same everything, could be so wildly different? Yeah, great question. I mean, that's probably a question for, like, a biologist more than, more than me, but I think that it is often about, like, things are coded into our DNA. We can be very different from one another. One of the things I mentioned is that um, our threshold for loneliness is actually coded into our bodies before we're born. Like, the fact that, like, maybe you experience, maybe, maybe you're, it sounds like maybe you're a little more extroverted than your brother, is my guess. So, like, that's something that's coded, <laughs> that's coded into you. You need more human connection, I'm guessing, than he does. Um, and there's nothing you can do to change that. So I think also, um, it's a little bit, it's not totally answering your question, but I think recognizing that everybody has those different needs is really important. Like the solution for every person is not the same. Yeah. Yeah, neither can I. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I never heard that. Um, I just thought that, was kind of interesting. that is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That is interesting. I think just um, related to the introvert and extrovert, actually, if you look at the literature, there's not a great correlation with loneliness. Mm -hmm. And what I found during the pandemic with some of my homebound older adults is that those were the, who were already homebound and isolated, they mm -hmm. didn't actually experience a big yeah. change in their loneliness mm -hmm. because this had been chronic for them. So it's an interesting thing, and we have to remember to distinguish, I think as you're doing, like when it's solitude by choice, yes. which is very different, which again, it gets to the definition of loneliness when there's a discrepancy between mm -hmm. the relationships that you want and those that you actually have. So it's, it's really a tricky thing, and I think you do a, just a beautiful job describing things Thanks. in your book. Yeah, you're exactly right. Actually, have a question about in your all your research and looking around, if you had ever come across um, any kind of material about comparing populations of people who are, say, engaged in either uh, spiritual practice mm -hmm. or uh, mindfulness or mm -hmm. these kinds of things uh, that are like meaning-making tools for people to get more comfortable with their loneliness. Uh, uh, did you come across anything like yeah, that? Yeah, that's a great question. So. If you're socially engaged in your community, whether that's faith-based or not, you are less likely to experience loneliness. And I think that's, if you think about that, it's like a common goal. So, like when you're working towards that together, it's just easier to feel like you're a part of something that's really important. Those things are changing as, there's a really famous book that came out in, I think 2000, uh, called Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. It was a really big, it's a gigantic book. It was, I think it just got reissued uh, with some new updated stats. But his argument was that, um, America is becoming more lonely because we are less civically engaged, we're less fa engaged in faith-based organizations, things like that. So like as our involvement in like, you know, bowling leagues, PTAs, church and stuff goes down, so too does our level of loneliness go up. I, uh, as a follow-up to it, because I guess I sort of uh, lumped uh, spirituality in, because it, it's, it's very sort of rational or intuitive to mm -hmm. me that, you know, if you have a community, a spiritual community, you feel more connected uh, on the other side, uh, the, I was thinking about, for uh, example, Tibetan Buddhist monks who like go up and spend years in caves in isolation mm -hmm. and come out quite happy. Yes. And sort of curious about 
that population? What, what is it ab about that? I feel like there's something there for us to learn. I think it's about that like deeper meaning, that deeper connection. Like even in those situations, if, when you're isolated, you feel like you're serving a greater good, a common goal, things like that. I think that that's a really big part of it. It's also we're less likely to feel uh, loneliness when we feel fulfilled by a you know creative professional project in those ways. It's it's harder to feel loneliness when we're not bored. I mean, I imagine being in a cave is kind of boring, but <laughs> but if we feel sort of fulfilled by a greater project, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we have time for like one more question if there's one last one. Otherwise we can wrap. Great. Thanks y'all so much.